Now we're going to talk about the systemic circulation and how blood flows from the heart out to the various parts of the body. And we're going to start with the blood flow to the head and the arms. So, of course, the blood flows from the heart to the ascending aorta, which is this portion here coming out of the left ventricle. The first arteries that branch off are the right and left coronary arteries. And they actually branch off down here, almost within the tissues of the heart. They're actually right above the semilunar valves. So in the video of the heart dissection, you'll see me point those out. Um, let's talk about the uh, coronary arteries themselves. Of course, they're the arteries here that supply blood to the heart tissues themselves. Um, atherosclerosis is a hardening of the arteries. And we really only worry about it uh, extensively in these coronary arteries. What happens is that cholesterol and fat starts to build up on the wall of the artery. It actually attaches to the lumen of the artery. Um, the presence of those molecules starts an immune response and the um, white blood cells that try to clean up that can't actually clean it up. They end up creating a, almost a scar. It's a hard plaque of tissue. Um, and that hard plaque then makes less space in the lumen for blood to flow through. And so the lumen of the artery narrows. So that can, of course, be very dangerous if that happens in the coronary arteries because less blood goes to the muscle of the heart. Um, the per one of the first people who really studied the effect of aging and health on the arteries was Marie Maynard Daly, um, who was a pioneering uh, African-American woman who studied cholesterol's effect on the artery, on the arteries, and um, how that led to high blood pressure. She was the first African-American woman to receive a PhD in chemistry in the United States, and that didn't happen until 1947. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, you know, how dramatic that is, Columbia University was established before our nation was established. It was known as King's College before that, uh, before the uh, revolution, and it has been uh, awarding PhDs in chemistry almost since its founding. So uh, it took about 200 years for a black woman to be awarded a PhD in chemistry. So. Uh, but thanks to her, we do now know a lot about that, and a lot of people have then uh, built on the pioneering research that she did. So if you do have atherosclerosis, um, it can lead to a heart attack, which is uh, where heart tissue actually starts to die because of a lack of blood flow. Uh, one of the ways that doctors can either prevent a heart attack or a uh, help someone after a heart attack is by an, a coronary artery bypass. And then what they do is they take uh, an artery from another part of the body, often from a cadaver, uh, and they sew one end onto the aorta. And the other, they literally bypass the blocked part of the coronary artery and uh, sew the new artery just below the blocked part. Uh, and that way, the blood coming, the blood still flows to the coronary artery before the blockage. Uh, and then a secondary blood supply allows blood to flow past the blockage. That's what a coronary bypass is. Uh, one of the other ways that they now do this is with the insertion of a stent, which is a little balloon type of thing. Uh, that it's a, it's a balloon inside a tube. Uh, and the tube can expand. And what they do is they uh, feed the tube down into the coronary artery um, and then uh, get to the blockage, put the balloon inside the blockage, expand the balloon, and that expands the little tube around it. And then that expands the walls of the artery. And then the balloon is removed, but the stent, which is the little expanding tube, that stays in place. 
Coronary bypass surgery is a, a, a highly invasive surgery. They actually have to open up the whole chest. Uh, they actually have to spread all the ribs, which involves breaking all of the ribs. Um, recovery from coronary bypass takes months. A stent insertion, assuming the person is otherwise healthy if they haven't had immediately had a heart attack, um, a stent can be inserted in an outpatient surgery, and you can be out and uh, being active immediately afterward or just a few hours afterward. So that can be a much better option if it's a possible option, depending on how bad the blockage is. All right, so those are the coronary arteries. Then the uh, aorta goes through the, makes the aortic arch and become, and then becomes the descending aorta. There are three branches off of the aortic arch. The first of those is the brachiocephalic trunk. And you remember that a trunk is an artery that then splits into named arteries. I remember we had the pulmonary trunk, which branched into the pulmonary arteries. In this case, the brachiocephalic trunk is going to branch into the right common carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. The common carotid artery is going to go up through the neck and supply the head. The right subclavian artery is going to go under the clavicle and to the right arm and some of the thoracic structures in the upper right quadrant. Now, these uh, blood vessels uh, originating off the aortic arch are not the same on the right and left. So this is really important that you keep all this straight. The next branch is the left common carotid artery. So remember we had the right common carotid artery coming off the brachiocephalic trunk. The left common carotid artery comes off directly off of the aortic arch. Um, this terminology, common carotid, we're going to see this again somewhere else. We have a common artery that uh, is an artery that is then going to branch into two other arteries with the same name usually. So in this case, it's going to branch into an internal and external carotid artery. And we're going to have that on the right and left side. So the right common carotid supplies the right side of the head and neck. Left common carotid supplies the left side of the head and neck. Then the next branch is the left subclavian artery. That's going to supply the left arm and some of the thoracic structures in the upper left quadrant. And then after the left subclavian branches off, the aorta, uh, the arch completes, the aorta starts going down, and it becomes the descending aorta. It descends first through the thoracic cavity, where it's the descending thoracic aorta, and then through the abdominal cavity, where it's the, wait for it, descending abdominal aorta. All right, now the uh, here's the brachiocephalic artery or brachiocephalic trunk. I like to call it the brachiocephalic trunk so that I remember that it branches into the two important things. The common carotid, the subclavian, and then coming off of the subclavian is the vertebral artery. And it's going to go up through the transverse foramina on the cervical vertebrae. That's why it's called the vertebral artery. It then goes through the foramen magnum to help supply blood to the brain. This circulation is going to be the same on the right and the left. Now here's a diagram of the inferior side of the brain. Here's the vertebral artery here. You can see it comes up through the foramen magnum with the spinal cord and it's going to run alongside the spinal cord and we do have branches coming off supplying blood to the back of the brain, uh, to the brain stem. Um, we're not going to worry about that. What we are going to worry about is that the vertebral artery fuses to become the basilar artery. This is not actually on your study guide, um, but it'll help when we get to this if you know what this is. So this is the basilar artery here. So that's the vertebral artery. Now remember the common carotid artery is going to split into an internal and an external. And in this case, these names are really helpful. The internal carotid artery is literally going to go to the inside of the skull and the external carotid artery is going to branch on the outside of the skull. 
Um, so you can see this external is going to supply all of these external skull structures, all of the skin, uh, the organs, all of this, all the muscles, all of that is going to be supplied by the external carotid artery. The internal carotid artery is going to go in through the carotid canal into the skull and supply the brain. Um, you don't need to know the names of all of these branches. It is in your textbook if you want to learn them. Uh, so, but this circulation is the same on the right and the left. So on these, I'm going to show you all of the circulation on the right side, but the circulation on the left is the same. It's just the branching off of the heart that's different. Okay, so here's uh, one of our torso models where you can see these really nicely. So here's a portion of the aortic arch. Here's the brachiocephalic trunk with the right common carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. The right common carotid artery divides into the internal carotid and the external carotid. The external is in front of the, of the internal. And then over here, we have the left common carotid. You can see it branches off from right here. And the left subclavian, you can see it branches off here, okay, from the aortic arch. The left common carotid then does the same thing as the right up here, branches into the left internal and left external carotid artery. Okay, so hopefully that's, that's helpful there. All right, now, the internal carotid arteries uh, are going to go through the carotid canal to supply blood to the brain. And along with the basilar artery, they are going to help form this structure here, which we call the Circle of Willis. Um, Willis was a scientist in the late 1700s, I believe, who was working on studying what uh, parts of the brain did. Uh, at that point, people thought that the ventricles of the brain were the important part of the brain, and that all of this stuff was just supportive goo. Uh, which doesn't sound very uh, smart today, but if you've seen a brain that uh, in a cadaver, the brain starts to break down very, very quickly, and it really does just dissolve into mush. So this probably made more sense then. Also, um, the idea that humors or liquid uh, were important was becoming, uh, was was very much I don't want to stay in style, but it was very common in those days. So the idea that the fluid in the brain was the important part kind of made sense with that thinking. Willis helped to figure out that the whole brain was important. But the other thing he helped to figure out was the circulation of blood around the brain. And the way he figured out that this structure enabled blood flow through the whole brain is that he experimented on dogs and he took a dog and he, he clamped the internal carotid artery on one side or the carotid artery, I guess, the common carotid on one side and uh, the dog was fine. Uh, it showed absolutely no change in behavior except, you know, its neck was sore. But even without any blood throw blood flow through the carotid on one side, the brain continued to get adequate blood flow. And that's because of this circle here, which is called an anastomosis. And an anastomosis is a group of arteries that make a circle and enable blood to flow in both directions through these tubes so that if any one of these is pinched off, blood from the others can flow to all the structures supplied by the anastomosis. So the circle of Willis is one of those anastomoses. Uh, Willis was also the one who figured out that there was such a thing as blood types, and he figured out that, that out by experimenting on dogs, uh, by putting blood from one dog into another dog. The first one he did it on, it worked. He got all his friends together and said, oh my gosh, look at this. He did it again, and it didn't work on another pair of dogs. And it took him a really long time to figure out. But he did eventually figure out that blood types were a thing. Okay, so we have the circle of Willis, the internal carotid arteries, and the vertebral arteries that become the basilar artery and then help to form that. 
Now, the blood, once it has circulated around the brain, it's going to leave through a couple different pathways. One is, you remember these venous sinuses, which are full of blood, right? And that blood has left the brain, pooled into these sinuses inside the meninges, and then these venous sinuses drain out through the internal jugular veins that travel through the uh, jugular canal, or jugular foramen. So there's one jugular foramen on either side of the skull. There's also this sinus in the middle, which we didn't talk about when we were learning the sinuses, uh, that drains out through another foramen. Both of those are going to drain into the internal jugular jugular vein. Okay, so the jugular veins run parallel to the carotid artery. So this is an example of pairs of arteries and veins that don't have the same name. Okay, so we have the carotid arteries and the jugular veins. Um, the carotid starts with a common carotid artery that branches into internal and external carotid arteries. The jugular, we have internal and we're going to have an external jugular vein that drains the structures on the outside of the head, outside of the skull, uh, those are going to say, stay separate. They're not going to fuse into a common jugular. There, there's just an internal and an external jugular. Okay, so you can see that here. So this is the internal jugular vein. You can see this is a really big vein that fuses with the, sub, or the subclavian vein, which goes to the arm. This is the external jugular vein. We also have the vertebral vein here, okay? So the external jugular is gonna drain these structures from the outside of the head um, and run parallel to the external carotid. It then fuses with the right subclavian, then the vertebral vein, it actually doesn't drain the same structures that the vertebral artery supplied. The vertebral vein is going to drain some of these external structures, especially some of these muscles on the back of the head. Uh, it comes down, it fuses with the subclavian vein, and then finally the internal jugular vein is going to come down and fuse with the subclavian. The After the internal jugular vein fuses with the subclavian vein, it then becomes the brachiocephalic vein. So this is, it's a big, long, scary word, but just remember our word o oh, word uh, construction. This is just brachio, you already know that brachy means arm. Cephalic, you already know cephalic means head. So brachiocephalic is arm and head. So the brachiocephalic carries blood from the arm and the head. And this circulation as well is the same on the right and the left, all of this. So here it is on our model. We have the um, in, internal and external jugulars. Here they do not show, sorry, the internal and external. They don't show the external jugular fusing down here. Okay, so that isn't shown. What we do have is the internal jugular here and here. We have the subclavian veins here. And after those two fuse together on both sides, they create the brachiocephalic veins. So the only difference here is that the two brachiocephalic veins are different lengths. The right is much shorter than the left. And that's because they're gonna to fuse together to form the superior vena cava which is going to enter on the right side of the heart. So the left brachiocephalic vein has to bring blood across to the right side. So that's why the left brachiocephalic is longer than the right brachiocephalic, okay? So internal jugulars fuse with the subclavian to create a brachiocephalic. That's the same on both sides. And then the two brachiocephalic veins fuse to create the superior vena cava and then the superior vena cava drains into the right atrium, okay? Um, and I talked a minute ago about finding your pulse uh, by looking next to your trachea. So what you're looking for is here the common carotid artery, okay? So that's what you're feeling. When you feel that pulse right in your neck, you're feeling that common carotid artery. All right. 
Um, let's pause there and then I'll come back and start with uh, the veins, the arteries and veins supplying the arms.